We also worked out air pockets and dry spots with rollers. We were working out into the nose of the shell now. The most important thing was to get all the air pockets out of corners and curves. Okay, it's gonna stick to the sides now, you guys who are holding the side. Now the big thing is here, let's not worry about how much resin we have yeah. that we put onto it, okay? Because we'll, we'll take it back off later. What we wanna do is get it thoroughly soaked. While removing excess resin from the body of the shell, a separate team laminated the wheel hub. The wheel hub would follow the lamination and vacuum bagging schedules exactly. Using a light, air bubbles can often be seen that would otherwise be missed. You have to be careful, however, to keep the light moving and not create a hot spot on the laminate. We still have three layers to go before we vacuum bag, so we don't want the resin to start curing in one hot place. When the resin is spread out like this, however, you have considerably more working time than when the resin is in a mixing tub. With a final check for air bubbles, the first layer was completed and we were ready for the second layer, which was a 45 degree ply. Cut diagonally off a roll of 50 inch wide fabric, the 45 degree layers were not long enough to cover the entire mold from nose to tail. This wasn't a problem. We just cut extra 45 degree bias pieces of fabric to fill in the gaps. We overlapped the pieces slightly as we applied them. Just as we finished the first layer, we were ready to roll in the second. By rolling it down the sides into the mold, we were able to ensure proper fiber orientation. If this became skewed, especially in addition to contact with wet resin, it would be difficult or impossible to line up without damaging the fibers. By rolling the fabric down the side, we could smooth the fabric as it went down rather than trying to pull it up from the bottom or tug it into place. We can rely on the existing resin to help saturate this layer as well as hold up the sides. We are still interested in time and want to move as quickly as possible without leaving any air pockets, dry spots, or excess resin. We also do not want to pull out excess fibers from the cut edges of the graphite. Fabrics want to shred when they are cut, and the problem gets worse when they are wet. We have to work carefully at these piece areas to make sure that loose fibers are not skewing the fiber orientation or causing air pockets. We can add triangular pieces to seam the rest of the 45 degree ply as soon as the large piece is completely smooth. We could rely on the resin from the first layer to hold the second in place as well as begin saturating it. When resin was applied to this layer, it was applied more carefully to avoid pulling up the edges in the spliced areas, and it was also applied more sparingly. We were still not real concerned about excess resin, as we needed some wetness to hold on to the third and fourth layers. We again covered the wheel hub with a layer of graphite, which was also cut at a 45 degree angle. At this point, we were approximately a half hour into the lamination. Although we had to mix a fresh batch of epoxy to continue, the resin that was in the mold was still wet and workable. The third layer was another 45 degree ply and was added much like the one you have just seen. It was rolled into position down the sides, pieced in where required by the bias cut, and separate 45 degree segments covered the rear wheel arch support. By now, little resin had to be applied to saturate the fabric as existing resin from the first three layers could be pulled up for wet out. Forty minutes have passed since we began. Just a small amount of resin was needed. At this point, we were concerned with removing as much excess resin as possible. The more resin removed, the lighter the final shell would be. We weren't worried about removing too much because thoroughly saturated fiber bundles will retain more resin than a squeegee can remove. With the excess resin removed by hand, we performed the final trimming of the mold flange before the vacuum bagging began. This was necessary in order to expose a few inches of the mold, which is where the sealant tape would be applied for the vacuum bagging process. We cleaned the flange with acetone to remove any excess resin. Resin would keep the tape from sealing. After the flange was clean, we laid the sealant tape down without removing the paper tape cover. We could remove this quickly when we were ready to seal the bag. Everyone was working independently and cohesively to get everything done as quickly as possible. We have been working with the resin for about an hour. The resin that is in the laminate is still wet and excess should still be removable through the vacuum bagging process. 
The laminate is now done and we are ready to vacuum bag. The first layer of vacuum bagging material we put into the mold was the peel ply layer. Peel ply should be used over any surface which contains resin. In this case, we chose the nylon peel ply because it would allow excess resin to pass through it while imparting a textured surface finish on the part. This surface texture allows for maximum secondary bonding with little or no surface sanding. The peel ply was cut roughly to length before the lamination began and was simply draped in place over the wet layup. We trimmed the excess peel ply, trying to get it to lay down over the part. The next layer to enter the mold was the bleeder breather cloth. This layer maintained even airflow over the entire surface of the lamination. It would also absorb the resin which flows from the part through the peel ply. It too must be cut so it will contact the entire mold surface without bridging or leaving voids. Additionally, two squares of this breather were also cut which were folded underneath the vacuum couplings. The extra breather material assures that the vacuum is not pinched off as it enters the bag and keeps the vacuum coupling base from printing through onto the molded part. Now we are ready to apply the bag. As part of the preparation of the vacuum bagging materials, the vacuum couplings were attached to the bag. Cuts were made in the bag before it was placed on the part to allow attachment of the couplings. We had decided to attach two vacuum tubes during each vacuum bagging routine, so we needed two couplings attached to each bag. We felt that two tubes would help ensure uniform vacuum. The final layer into the mold is the vacuum bag itself. It is dropped loosely into position just like the other vacuum bagging materials, but as soon as you are sure that you have a proper fit, it needs to be sealed to the mold flange. You need to seal the bag on all edges. Start firmly pressing the bag to the tape in one location and work around the perimeter of the part, removing paper and attaching the bag. Be sure to pull the bag taut before sticking it to the tape as even small wrinkles can cause frustrating leaks. If you encounter complex contours, you would make pleats or tucks so excess bagging film is available to fully cover all areas. Do not rely upon this material to stretch. If necessary, use sealant tape or other sections of bagging film to enlarge or widen the bag. Keep this to a minimum, however, because it is another location for potential leaks. The mate of the coupling was attached after the bag was in place. A separate bag was pieced together to cover the rear wheel arch and was spliced into the main bag using sealant tape. As you can see, the bag over the arch should have been pre-fitted to ease its assembly. We decided to pre-fit the bag for the next lamination. As the bag was worked into place, the square sections of breather cloth were positioned under the vacuum couplings. This would both ensure vacuum over the part and keep the couplings from leaving an impression on the carbon. We were also filling the pleats and tucks with sealant tape. We had to plug all the leaks. We had forced as much trapped air out of the bag as possible while massaging the bag into all portions of the mold. It is necessary to make sure the bag contacts the entire mold surface. As pressure began to build, the team worked the bag into all cavities one last time. We made sure that all portions of the bag were in full contact with the part surface. There were a few leaks to locate before maximum vacuum pressure was reached. The students simply circled the mold, listening for the telltale soft whistle of air entering the bag. 